Welcome to the Tuscarawas County Anti-Drug Coalition podcast, bringing you open and honest conversations about resources in Tuscarawas County. Now here's your host, Jody Salvo. Hi, this is Jody Salvo. Welcome to another Tuscarawas County Anti-Drug Coalition podcast. Um, I'm really excited about our guest here today, um, but I also want to, before I introduce them, just kind of explain why they're here today and um, just kind of the direction we're moving right now. Tuscarawas County is hosting an initiative right now called Project Hope. And and it's in response to just a drastically high increase in overdoses and overdose deaths that we have experienced in the first six months of 2020 with the pandemic. And, And it hasn't stopped where our stats were the first six months, we've just seen an incredible uptick in suicides and drug overdoses, drug overdose deaths, Um, because the pandemic's hard. It's caused increased stress on an entire community, but especially for those persons that are struggling with addiction. Um, So our guests today um, are our judges, and um, um, Judge... Tamakis, I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself and what you do, and then we'll okay. go to Judge Van Alman. Okay. Um, I'm Elizabeth Lehi Tamakis. I am the Common Police Court Judge for the General Trial Division, and uh, I'm actually one of three Common Police Court Judges, too, in the General Trial Division. Um, it's a job I've had for 22 years, and um, in that time, I did develop um, a specialized docket, and my specialized docket is, is 15 years old. And yours was one of the first in the state of Ohio, and right? It was pretty early on, yeah. Okay. I, was, I was one of the um, first members of the Supreme Court Commission on Specialized Dockets, and um, as a part of that, when they started the, uh, the certification process, I was in that first group to be certified. Uh, but the certifications came in in 2014. Um, I actually started my program in 2005. So I will tell you, you all um, have a different language. So can you explain to people what a specialized docket is? Um, sure. Yeah, the specialized docket is uh, a different tract uh, that we follow in the court Um commonly known as a drug court. Sometimes you hear mental health court or veterans court. And and really, it's uh, a group of cases uh, or people involved in cases that are set aside and um, they engage in supervision and treatment. But the, the I would say the uh, characteristic that really sets it aside or sets it apart from anything else we do is that there is weekly or regular accountability directly with the judge. Okay. So we can talk more about what that looks Very like good. in a minute. So. Okay. So 15 years, come please court, drug court. Yeah. Okay. Judge Van Allman. So my name is Nan Von Allman, and I am the municipal court judge, New Philadelphia municipal court judge. Um, my jurisdiction in my court covers the northern half of Tuscross County, and then Judge Hillier has the southern half. So okay. he's kind of my counterpart in the southern half of the county. And um, I have been, I was a magistrate since 2003 and then was elected in November of 2011. Okay. So I'm about halfway through my second term. And uh, I've had a um, recovery court, which is also could be called a drug court, um, for about... This will be our sixth year, okay. I believe. And so we just got recertified, fifth year, excuse me. And we just got recertified by the Supreme Court. So every couple of years, we have to submit all of our program uh, goals, how we operate, who's on our team. Um, you know, this is a very holistic approach. Sure. So I have a, um, a committee that helps to guide me, uh, just different people from the community, prosecutors, police officers, it's just, um, you know, sort of a conglomerate of people that have an interest in the issue of recovery uh, from drugs and alcohol. Uh, Then I have a treatment team, which um, advises me, and I I wouldn't be able to do it without my treatment team. Right now I have a, you know, um, 
when we first started out, of course, we had Judge Tamakas's um, example to follow, and and she was very uh, helpful in she and Elizabeth Stevenson, her court administrator, in guiding us and telling us what works and what doesn't. Because I'm all about not reinventing sure, the wheel. Absolutely. When I see somebody that does something that works, I, I may call. So with you, yep. I may call and say, can I have your permission <laughs> to copy uh, some of the things that you're doing? Um, you know, I want to be pl- polite and professional about it, but I have no qualms about. It just shows that you are a wise, efficient woman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no right. point in, you know, trying to. And, you know, I did a lot of, of study before we started our court. I went to a lot of trainings with the National Association. Association of Drug Court Professionals. The Ohio Supreme Court is phenomenal uh, with a specialized docket committee that uh, Judge Tamakis is so involved with. So I learned a lot. You remember the first year? I don't even know, Jody, if you were there, the opiate conference that the state of Ohio I do. had. I was there at your table at lunch, I remember. And that um, psychiatrist, and what is his name, that talked about the squirrel brain? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Just talked about that people have this little part of their brain that just drives desire and drives, you know, yep. it's supposed to be good things, but then it turns into if you if you put drugs and alcohol in there, then that's what, you know, the squirrel brain wants what it wants. I tell people that all the time in recovery court, yep. and we're going to overcome that. So I don't, in any event... Um, I learned a lot at that conference, and it's like a light bulb went off. Nice. You know, and the first thing I learned to do was stop saying to people, why don't you just stop? (laughs) Why don't you just, you know, they took away your kids, and you lost your job, and you lost your car, and you lost your house. Why don't you just stop? I, you know, I learned. It's hard to understand. Mm -hmm. It is, and and we need things like the squirrel brain. And I forgot about that video, so maybe we'll put it on the Anti-Drug Coalition on our Facebook page. There's, There's some great videos now about addiction, but I think for a person that has not, does not have that in their life or a close family member, it is so hard to understand addiction. You know, I think you almost have to hear it over and over because it makes no sense. And that's why we go, why don't you stop? And then you realize it's really, really challenging to stop. And, you know, I, I would say on a more human level, if you can find something in your life that is important to you or that you have a hard time resisting, like maybe it's sweets. And I realize it may not be, you know, as deadly, it's not illegal, but, but it, you know, it could be unhealthy for somebody. And so sometimes I just try to substitute, um, you know, drugs, which is something that doesn't attract me to something that would attract me, let's say sweets and say, Well, I understand that people, if you get into a situation, you're around people, places, and things where there's going to be sweets. And if that's your thing, then you are more likely to give in to it. And sometimes if I, if I put it like in my thought process as something, uh, a little more ordinary then I can understand and, and it helps me understand you know, we talk a lot about people changing the people they're around, the places they go, mm-hmm. the things that they do to avoid those temptations that are illegal. And if you, you kind of put it in that mindset of how does that relate in my life, you know, yeah. whether it's sweets or food or, you know, some other thing. So I'm looking at both of you. First of all, for anyone that does not know these two ladies, they are amazing community leaders as well. You guys on task forces, coalitions, you're willing to be available whenever asked from community agencies or other leaders. Um, And I've seen your passion and concern for those that you work with and those that are struggling with addiction. So I'm struggling where to even start here because I think there's two things I'd love to start with. Maybe the changes you've seen in the community and addiction over time. Maybe let's start there. How about that? Okay. Um, I was just I was just thinking about how, you know, one of the frustrations that I had, and I know Judge Tamakas was doing it many, many years before me, is that when she started, and even then when I came on board with the concept of treatment. Yeah. Treatment. 
So you have a, a hammer over someone's head that if you don't do the treatment, you're going to go to jail. Um, but if they're not motivated inside, if the only motivation is just to avoid jail, usually they're not successful. But, you know, the community was not on board with that concept. Basically, um, we got a lot of pushback. We got a lot of um, uh, skepticism. And I think Judge Tamakas did a lot for changing the narrative on that. But it also was my experience, even when I started, that the people that were willing to get involved, to be on the opiate task force, to be on the anti-drug coalition, were people that had a story in their own life or their own families Mm -hmm. where they had suffered because of addiction. Either it's their mother and pain pills or it's their brother and methamphetamine. And so, you know, I don't know if that the group of people willing to become involved grew because the use of drugs grew or, um, you know, but in the beginning it was people who had a story, who had a connection. But Project Hope... This whole idea, Jody, of, yeah. I mean, this thing has been phenomenal because it has changed people's hearts. It really has. Yeah. And it isn't just a matter of, well, they sit there on that Sunday, one Sunday a year and they listen yeah. to the story. I have people from the churches, and I'm sure Judge Tamakis does too, coming to me. And I actually have now a pastor on my treatment team, and his church has been phenomenal Neat. with and they provide mentors. He paid for people to go to a special mentoring program because when we were first going to have mentors from the church, I was like, okay, but we need to make sure that these people understand that someone who is still in the early stages of recovery or perhaps in relapse and addiction will eat them alive yep. if they are not, if they don't have the proper understanding, if they don't have the proper boundaries, you know. And he's, it's been an amazing, I was a little bit worried about, yeah. but that came directly out of Project Hope was this church just literally coming to me, calling me on the phone and saying, what can we do? And I said, well, we need this, this, and this, and they've come through. So, so that's, uh, things have changed from people being, you know, you're, you're just handholding, you're mm-hmm. babying them. Um, why should we give people Narcan? They just need to die. Why don't they yeah. just quit? I mean, that was true. Yeah. That was yeah. the narrative. And it has, Project Hope has made a huge, because you're going to the people and educating them. Yeah. And I do think we've learned so much. I mean, from professionals to our community members, I I think that education and awareness has been huge. And then, you know, throw on the whole opioid epidemic, because you all were doing this before, that really right. hit. You know, so then we saw the demise happening in our community, in the state of Ohio, across the nation. So I think that was also helpful for people to understand, okay, there's more to addiction than than probably we do understand. Right. I would say um, the the nature of the drug use has definitely changed. Okay. Um, so what were you seeing 15 so, years ago? Well, even let's start with 22 years ago. I took the bench in January of 1999 and, uh, generally would see that, um, we had crime wise, uh, felonies of the fourth and fifth degree. So, um, for, for your audience that may not know, uh, felony crime is the level of crime that results could result in prison. Okay. Um, and the felony of the first degree is the mo- the most serious. The felony of the fifth degree would be the least. And so I was a new judge. I was usually seeing felonies of the fifth degree, fourth degree, passing bad checks, some thefts, and... Um, people may not know that before sentencing, I get a very thorough investigation report about the individual I'm sentencing. And part of that, they share, uh, they will self-report what their drug use has been. Okay. And I would say um, 22 years ago, I usually saw alcohol was the first drug, usually around the age of 14. Mm -hmm. Immediately thereafter, 
marijuana. And then usually the third drug was cocaine. Okay. And um, most of what I was seeing at the time stopped there. Um, It's changed over time. We started seeing crack cocaine, and then that's when I started to get more violent offenses. Um, And then there was the the opiate, the rise of the opiates. Um, And what year did you all start seeing the opioids? Gosh, I I specifically remember methamphetamine in 2014. Opiates was before that. Okay. So um, 10, maybe. Um, We could probably go back and tie it in with when um, the drug companies, Purdue and the drug companies started to... um, Push the OxyContin. Sure. Push, push the OxyContin and hire the 300,000 right. salespeople throughout the and, country. And, and a big part of the addiction, oh, the, the, the narrative I would get on that would be also prescription drug abuse. And we were, you know, hearing about people getting into parents' cupboards, grandparents' sure. cupboards. Um, but the change that I see now is um, it rarely starts with alcohol. Um, it's what's it starting with? almost always marijuana. I would say marijuana 98% of the time is the first drug. I am so glad you bring that up just for our audience. Um, there's so much dialogue around marijuana and I, so many efforts, I even federally to decriminalize it or, or legalize it. It's not a big deal. It helps for, opiate addiction, and yet there's a plethora of research out there, and we see it emerging all the time that, yeah, marijuana use, especially for undeveloped brain, it's, it, I would say, um, you know, I've had a lot of people say, gosh, I got hooked on opiates because I had this surgery and, and I had this medication, but even for those people, and mind you, the only reason I'm talking to them is because they've then committed a felony sure. of some kind. Um, I'll look at the pre-sentence investigation report and see that they were they were a marijuana user in their history. And so um, I, I really have not seen anybody leap into those harder drugs. Sure. It's, it's usually started with marijuana, and that's that's the trend I see now. They go straight from marijuana to either, um, well, prescription drug abuse, heroin, or um, methamphetamine. Sure. And and now we're back. You know, we kind of did uh, saw the trend, at least in my court, of um, the opiates, um, the meth that people were cooking, and then it went back to opiates for a while, and now it's meth that's being purchased elsewhere. And, and brought into Ohio. So. The other thing I'm just going to say on this, we're the Anti-Drug Coalition, and our mission is to prevent use substance use. And when I hear you talk, there's nothing new under the sun other than the, direct, the drugs get harder and crazier. But we tend to play this whack-a-mole that we're trying to treat the drug, the, the trendy drug of the designer drug of the time, as opposed to what are the root causes? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Until we really deal with the root causes of why are people seeking substances, we're probably going to continue this cycle. So I just appreciate you kind of laying out. We went to here, then to here, and then back to here. And, you know, it it is important for us to understand that there are some underlying root causes. And I'm probably sure when you get those reports, you're probably seeing persons that have suffered a lot of trauma growing up. They've been from probably crazy life situations and very often. And um, even people that, you know, I, and I think judge Von Allman touched on this a little bit with um, the trend in not really wanting to treat to now people are, they know somebody, you know, now it's hitting home with more and more people. So we used to think, well, it doesn't happen to a good family. But then, you know, you read these investigation reports and you find out even in a good family, somebody could have suffered abuse, sure. maybe not from their own parents, but maybe from somebody outside the family and uh, or had some other kind of trauma that led them 
in this direction. Um, I would say there's a lack of resilience with people um, yeah. to to deal with what life throws at them. I don't know what the answer to that is. Well, I'm going to say, because I'm sure we're going to talk about this, but in recovery court or drug court, those teams that you assembled do help with all those skills, right? You have people helping with life skills and job skills. And tell us a little bit about the program itself. Maybe. So, um, you know, in my court, my, my cases are less um, extreme. And how do I say it? In terms of possible penalties. Okay. So if you um, are convicted of a misdemeanor in municipal court, you cannot go to prison, state okay. prison for that. The only thing that you can do um, is serve on the most serious offenses like domestic violence, assault, uh, violating a protection order, OVI. You could serve up to six months in the county jail. Okay. So in some ways I have less Teeth. leverage. Yeah, there's, there's got to be a lot more carrot and a little less hammer. I guess okay. is it has to be my approach, um, but in terms of the and, and you know we said the holistic approach to it. So um, when I start rattling off everything that we do, then I start having that little voice in the back of my head saying, "Oh, so much hand holding." But in fact, what we're trying to do, a lot of the people that are in my program right now, um, come from a place of complete chaos, mm-hmm. and some of them were raised in chaos. Perhaps their mother was a single mother who suffers from a severe mental illness, Mm -hmm. but raised the child nonetheless. Um, The parents may have had drug or alcohol issues, and so that sort of permeates everything. If your father's an alcoholic, um, it may not change your DNA, but it certainly infuses every cell in your body. I can can tell you that from, from uh, personal experiences of people that I love and also now the people that I deal with in my court. So um, they come from a place where they don't know anything but chaos or they don't know anything but um, going from one man to the next that just uh-huh. uses them and abuses them terribly. They, that's it. That's right, all they know. Right, right. And, 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 and when you have that much dysfunction, chaos, pain, the one thing that's steady is getting high. Yeah. So you wake up and you hit the one hit pipe and you, and you get, and you smoke pot um, or you, uh, you know, you, you use meth. I mean, one of the things that I'm seeing now, and I don't know what Judge Marcus has to say, but I just said to someone the other day, I'm seeing a trend of like, I'm going to call them housewives using methamphetamines like it's like they're drinking energy drinks. Mm. It's, it's so many things have become normalized. So some people come from a place of chaos. Some people are living, as she said, a normal life. And yet, for whatever reason, they feel the need. They need more energy. They need to calm down. They, you know, there's so like everybody thinks that there's a pill to fix everything. And so a lot of what we talk about in my program is how do you learn to live inside your own head peacefully and how do you learn to make connections with other people? So that's why we have all these team members because we have the counselors that help people realize, uh, learn how to be more mindful, how not to just slingshot from one, you know, crisis to another then we do have people to help with employment because some of the people in our program, the only thing they've ever known is you just go and you work in this fad, fast food place for a while and then you go and you work in this fast food place and there's nothing wrong with sure. that. But you don't get a lot of sometimes self-satisfaction. Exactly. Some people do. Some people, you know, and it's fine. But if you don't, then then how are you going to plan long term? You're, you're living one day at a time in your sobriety, right? right. That's, that's the mantra. But you also have to have some goals for yourself in your life. If you don't achieve them, you learn how to deal with the disappointment. And if you do, you learn how to feel, hey, I deserve this. You know, there's a lot of self-sabotage that goes on in addiction. You make a little bit of progress and you go, oh, I don't know. Those, Those people in my past or that voice in my head telling me, 
you know, you're worthless, you're nothing, you don't deserve this. So, you know, that, that's hard to overcome that kind of. We hear some of our past podcasts, we've been speaking with people in recovery and you hear that over and over just because the shame and the guilt and, and, um, everything that can come along with lying, stealing, cheating to get your drug, to get your needs met causes a lot of feelings. It sounds like in your self-worth and ability. And I can see where you need that longer accountability, which comes through your programs to kind of walk alongside people so they can learn skills and they can have an accountability. And, you know, that certainly is not going to happen overnight. Well, and not to sound like I'm tooting our horn, but um, they do say that the reason that these specialized dockets work is because of the judge's involvement. Yeah. Because before I did drug court, um, the only time I saw anyone who was on supervision is when they did something badly. Okay. So I would place someone on supervision in the community, order them to get treatment, to get a job, maybe, you know, pay restitution to okay. a victim or whatever those, those terms are. And they leave the courtroom. If they do well, I don't see, never them, see again. them again. Okay. I would only see people when they did things badly. So they would bring him in on a motion to revoke because you're not doing this. You're not doing that. And so it, it, it's really a steady diet of negativity. Mm. Um, and so then once I started um, the drug court, it was that one time in my week when I got to see see someone doing well and commend them for it nice. and, and just say, I'm really excited you got that job. Or, I'm so proud of you for finishing your GED or, or even for taking the first step towards a GED or, or whatever, whatever the small accomplishments are or the big accomplishments, um, celebrating four months sober, six months sober, a year sober. But um, I think that the research shows that it's that judicial involvement, the fact that there's that weekly accountability or maybe biweekly where a judge um, says, I'm proud of you, or you get to share your achievement for the week with a judge. And, um, and at its core, I think what we've discovered is that what works in recovery is relationships. And so it's um, the fact that I really do care and want mm -hmm. them to recover. My probation staff really does care and want them to recover. And, and they're at the end of the phone if they're needed. Um, the uh, counselors are there. You know, uh, we try to direct people. Look, I know you live in a house with, your mom or your dad and, and, or maybe a brother or somebody who's not healthy for your recovery. Let's try and find you somewhere else to live. That's safe. That's going to support your recovery. And, you know, we do all of those things, but I think for uh, some of the people by the time, especially in the felony court, by the time they get to me, they've been through a lot of other I'm sure. things. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, it, what we try to show is that we really do care and yeah. we want to see them succeed. Um, the Was that a hard paradigm shift as a judge from when you started? Um, I, I think how you, you would practice to how you are now in recovery or drug court, just being a champion of persons. It wasn't it? a hard shift for me because okay. when I was a magistrate, um, I was a magistrate for Judge Mary Space, okay. who was who had been on the bench for over twenty years, and was very. Um, she just has a very kind, peaceful, um, patient personality, which is very different than okay. how I conducted myself in private practice. I was very aggressive and you know take no prisoners type of approach. Yeah, yeah. So I brought that to the bench, and it wasn't working. Okay. And I was seeing the same people over and over again. And I had a guy, I saw the same guy, and he kept doing really terrible things, road rage in incident, and just really stupid self-destructive things, but he was also harming other people in the community. Okay. 
And I was so exacerbated with him, and I just, I, I just said, no, that's not the word I want. I was so um, we'll just say out of patience, yeah, frustrated. Yeah. That's okay. it. I was so frustrated with him, and I just said, you know, why do you keep doing this stupid stuff? And he looked at me. He was so sincere. He didn't like me, but he wanted to tell me that I was being an idiot. And he said, if you had been treated and talked to the way that I was my whole life, he said, and I'm not making excuses. I'm just telling you that maybe you wouldn't know how to act either. Mm. You know, you just think everybody's supposed to act like you. I don't know. It just, it just wow. kind of stopped me in my tracks, mm -hmm. you know, that just talking to people, you know, being really stern and negative and things like that, they'd heard it their whole lives. It, yeah. it was going in one ear and out the other. So when I made the transition and learned, you know, what the study showed actually was effective, that was very, you know, I'm very interested in science. I believe strongly yeah. in yeah. science. And then when I started seeing in my own courtroom that the things that the studies and the, and the people before me showed worked, I was more than happy to sure, change. And actually. it was so much less stressful. Neat. It, so how often do you all see successes? Like let people know that success happens. Recovery happens. And I know it does. all might be in those cycles because we know it a lot of times doesn't happen the first time. But I'm confident you all see some neat stories. Well, um, you know, one one that comes to mind is there was a young man in drug court um, did very well. Uh, and, and here's the thing when they, when they start their particular offense kind of goes into my, on my back burner okay. and I focus on recovery. That's what we're here for. So right. I couldn't even tell you what his original offense was, but, um, he, he just did what he needed to do, worked really hard, um, got involved with his church mm -hmm. and towards the end um, when he was very mature in his recovery and almost ready to graduate, my program is about 18 months long. Okay. Um, he started, uh, he had to ask permission to date one of the women in the program, young okay. lady, very young lady, young twenties. Um, he graduated. Uh, she continued and she graduated um, eventually they got married, had, you know, just, uh, he's got a great job. Oh, nice. I mean, they just really made a difference. But, um, before the wedding, after his graduation, he was driving to work and, uh, witnessed an accident on route 250 okay. interstate or the, yeah. the state route. And, uh, jumped out of his car and went to the aid of the driver and prayed with him uh, until yeah. someone could come and rescue him. And I just think about, you know, if he hadn't focused on his recovery, if he hadn't done uh, everything he needed to do to be there in that moment, you don't know what would have happened to sure. that young driver. It was a high school, high school wow. driver. Um, so that, you know, those kind of stories are great. It was great to see them married. Um, his mother approached me at a um, community event, uh, reintroduced herself and told me again how well he was doing. And, you know, that makes it great. I've had, um, I've had a woman stop by to show me her healthy newborn child oh, or, you know, young, neat. young child. I've had someone stop by to show me they got a college ID and oh, had enrolled so in school. Fun. You know, so there are some successes. Um, by and large, I would say maybe 25% of the people who start the program actually succeed in finishing it. Um, but, but you know what? Uh, That's still an encouraging percentage. Mm -hmm. uh, we just had a press conference last week, and one of the reporters asked, they didn't feel like the number that had died was that big of a number. And and I'm just going to be real honest. And Natalie from the Adams Ward goes, you know, one is too many. And and when you stop and think that's somebody's mom or child or wife or 
Right. You know, it's somebody, someone. Right. And even one is too many. So 25%. And and you're having cases that are probably someone really steeped in their addiction. Yeah. By the time you're looking at, you know, prison, you've been around the block probably a couple of times. So. Right. Ours are more medium to high risk. So 25%. I mean, we got to say, I mean, that's awesome. And I'm thinking you might even have a better success well, percentage, right? I think I had I haven't had near the cases that Judge Tamakas has okay. had. We have had eighty three participants, twenty graduations, um, and we've had um three pass away, That's... two in the program. I've had two two of the three overdose deaths were in the last six months. Oh. So they, they were not in the program any longer. So, you know, that I just I feel that but But I'm sure uh, you feel pretty attached to your participants? Or well, yeah, you, you develop a relationship. Know, yeah. I mean, it's just like going to school with someone for yeah. 18 months. You know, you, you develop, uh, you get to know them yeah. and you get to know, you know, their strengths and their weaknesses. And they tell you what they think of you sometimes. And, <laughs> you know, we have people that sometimes say they're going to quit. And so they give me an earful. And then um, they do have to, you know, in many cases go and sit out their jail term, and after they're there a week or two, they write me a letter, and maybe we take them back in. But, you know, our, our graduation rate is about 29%, okay. but that's not the whole picture. Okay. Because, and, and, and I don't have the statistics with me, and I apologize, but one of the things that we're trying to do, judges have two jobs, okay. punish and protect the public, okay. and that's basically it. That is like the shortest statute in the Ohio Revised Code. It's like that passage in the Bible that says, Jesus wept. Well, the (laughs) sentencing statute in the Ohio Revised Code is similar. Uh, Sentencing is about punishment and protecting the public. Okay. And sometimes punishment protects the public, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes, you know, you send people to jail, and sometimes I say that's basically school for criminals in in many ways, especially when you have a lot of felons in the county jail now, and now I'm going to send a low-level, you know. To learn stuff. Yeah. um, Somebody that stole some stuff from Walmart. Okay. If I send them to jail, now they learn how to pass bad checks and how to use credit card. It's, anyway, the success rate is that I is the recidivism, the repeat okay. offenders. So people may not graduate because either they decide that they aren't just going to finish the program, they're just going to do their jail. And with misdemeanors, you do get more of that because again, it's they aren't going off to time. prison sure. for years. I mean, they they're always triangulating and doing the math. Well, I only have 39 days left in jail. So if I went to jail, I could be done with that. And, you know, sometimes it's because they want to be able to go out and have a beer or something. But a lot of them will stay in AA. Okay. They'll keep a sponsor. And eventually, so we give them the tools, Mm -hmm. and maybe they don't successfully graduate. But they're that much closer to understanding the benefits of sober living. Mm -hmm. They may not make it completely, but... If they're not going out and binge drinking and then getting in a fight and beating someone's head into the sidewalk in front of one of the bars. We'll take that as a win. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't have that statistic in terms of recidivism, but we are not seeing. Some people are with us always. We're going to see them in municipal court (laughs) until I'm not there or they're not there. I mean, you know, we have not... It, it, it's not a miracle cure. Sure. But I, I just have to say that it's it's better than the way we used to do things. One of the reasons it's better is because these pe- folks in both of our courts have to call in every day okay. to a drug testing system called iSAMSON. And it tells them if they're being drug tested that day, seven days a week, weekends, holidays. They always have in their mind could be my day. Could be my day. And and we change it up all the time. So you may test, you may call in and test on Tuesday and you test negative. And then you te- get called again on Wednesday to test. You test negative because it's all random. So then sometimes people will think, well, I already tested twice this week. So I could probably, you know, smoke a little pot and 
Yeah. Well, guess what? We're going to test yeah, you Yeah, so time. it takes them a while to catch on to that, but we never stop the drug testing the whole time when they're in the program. And the reason we're doing that is because every day that your brain is chemical-free, it's healed just a little yep. bit more. A couple more cells light back up the right way Yeah. in terms of, you know, a few more endorphins are produced, so you can start to feel a little bit happier mm-hmm and a little bit more contented without drugs. So, you know, there's a lot of things that we do to hold people account. I say to people, go to an AA meeting, even if it's not your thing, because sound waves are going to come in and hit your eardrums and send a a signal to your brain, and your brain's going to learn something. Because your brain is controlling your behavior right now, and your brain's going to learn something that you refuse to learn. So... You know, and if they're there just to avoid jail, I'll take it in the beginning. I don't, I don't need perfect intentions. I just need people willing to make some steps in the right yeah, direction. Yeah, baby steps. Now, you all, do you all work with the Vivitrol programs and oh, yeah. what else? Yeah, I was just so our audience can. Yes, I would. I have to give Judge Von Allman the credit for that because um, we tried when Vivitrol was new and newly introduced as a um, uh, blocker for opiates because they'd been around for years for for alcohol. alcohol. Um, But just we were not able to find anyone willing to take that step. And and this goes back uh, several years. And then uh, Judge Von Allman went to that summit and came back on a mission. So I'm just going to let her talk about it. I'm going to let her talk about it because I am, I am so grateful to have her to work with as my colleague on the bench. I'm grateful that she's got a program uh, at the misdemeanor level that will potentially keep people from coming uh, to, your to my court and, and frequently I'll have someone who may come to my court who's already involved in her court mm-hmm. And I just defer and, you know, so we're able to work together with common people. But the Vivitrol, definitely her baby. I'm giving her all the credit and I'll let well, her tell you about it. Before you explain what that is to everybody, what I think is so beautiful, you just said, I follow the science. And I can hear that in, in how you're speaking. And I bet there's probably recovery courts that are not nearly as successful or drug courts that you have. Because you guys are saying, okay, what works? You know, you were, you were just explaining that if someone has every day with a clearer brain, they have a better chance of, of successful recovery. So you're saying, okay, hear the right information, do the right things, get the accountability. And that's why I kind of Vivitrol makes sense. So explain to people why and what that is. And well, I works. mean, I, I do, I really do believe in the science. And and the fact of the matter is, is that if I could have done algebra and calculus and statistics, I would have went to medical school Mm -hmm. because that's where my passion always was. But my brain didn't go in that direction. So uh, I ended up in law school and on the bench. But, you know, I just, so I did, I actually went to one of the opiate conferences Mm -hmm. Well, and I heard a presentation on Narcan. I heard about a pilot project in a small community on Narcan, Mm -hmm. which is the drug that they give when someone has overdosed to to revive them. And then I heard about Vivitrol, which is basically the same type of medication. Narcan, you just give a big dose all at once to bring someone back before they expire from an overdose. And Vivitrol is something that they receive an injection once every 30 days, and it blocks the receptor. So if you take an opiate or you use an opiate, you don't get high from it. Um, So it has to be used under medical uh, supervision. But I went to the summit and I heard about, they have this pilot project here for Narcan, then they're using Vivitrol. And I I did, I just come back on a mission like, like, why can these people have this? And we can't have it. Like, I cannot accept that. (laughs) And so... You know, I just, I, I sort of am a driven person. Yeah. That's my personality. And so I just started making asking happen, questions yeah. and bugging people. No, I didn't make it. I mean, there was no way. Right. Without Vicki Iono and Dr. Varadi mm-hmm. basically saying, 
we could do this. Right, right. You know, and picking a, a Vicki Iono, the new Philadelphia health commissioner, went up to Oriana House and spent the day, just took it on herself, went up to Oriana House, spent the day learning about their Vivitrol program, and then came back and explained it to us in a way that we could understand, but explained the science and how it works. And she was very enthusiastic based on what she heard as a nurse. So then a few more people thought, well, maybe that's not a bad idea. And then we were able to, you Get know. That. Yeah. So any listeners from Tuscarawas County, this is the reason I love Tuscarawas County. It is persons like you and other community leaders, when they see a problem, really are committed to seeing a solution to it. And, you know, I can't even tell you, because I do spend a lot of time in Columbus, how often I hear Tuscarawas County leading the way. And it's for reasons like this, that, you know, we hear that there's a solution out there and we are so committed to our community and making this a better place. And, you know, those two things, the naloxone and the Vivitrol, those were game changers for our county, absolute game changers on um, keeping people alive and, and getting people healthy enough to step into recovery that, you know, you can think clearly and you're, you're not having drug dreams and all mm-hmm. those things that are a complete barrier to getting healthy. So I thank you for that. And um, pretty neat. Yeah, well, I mean, I've, I've actually really, you know, enjoyed learning all the things that yes. I've learned. It's, it's, been a, it's been a huge learning experience because I, I didn't know anything about it. But when you start to look at it, you know, it isn't just because someone's a bad person. It isn't just because they have a character flaw. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not because they want to live their life in, you know, if people would see, you know, the degradation and the, I mean, it, people talk about rock bottom. Yeah. In my opinion, there is no rock bottom because no matter how far down I see people go in their addiction, there's always something worse that can yeah. happen. Yeah. Like, um, you know, okay, so you, I talked about women that have very poor relationships with men. So we had a woman in our program that was trying to get sober. Well, everywhere she would go, she would run into men who used to exchange drugs for sex with her. You know, it was very difficult for her to get away from that. So she made bad choices. She relapsed, ended up overdosed, and got thrown out of a car only a top on, no pants, doesn't know why that happened, and they dumped her off in front of a hospital. So just when you think that it can't get any worse, it can. So, you know, when you see people that are willing to come back from that kind of things that you can't even imagine, like I can't imagine. So I never talk about rock bottom because there's always just a little bit. You've seen way too much. Yeah, and sometimes living with addiction I mean, overdosing is, is the worst thing, obviously, that can happen. But living with addiction can be just almost sure, as sure. bad as that. So we just keep trying. Yeah. We just keep trying. We have, you know, uh, like when people come into the program and they test positive and they don't get in trouble necessarily for using, they get in trouble for lying about okay. the using because okay. the lying is the behavior that enables them to continue to use okay. forever. So they will get a sanction, which could be a day in jail, a day on the work crew, um, write an essay about, I, I sign a lot of essays about scientific stuff. Oh my goodness, that's <laughs> about, right. about how the brain works and and also things like mindfulness and, and sure. purpose in life and things. But anyway, they get a sanction for the lying but the relapse, we just step up, okay. Okay, what do we need step to Step up the treatment. Right, right. right. And I don't know, I knock on this beautiful wood table that we have, but things are going really well right now. Um, we just seem to have the right combination of probation officers and people on the team, prosecutors and attorneys, and the treatment people that we have are phenomenal. You know them all. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right. And you had mentioned faith-based recovery at one point, too. Do you see that becoming more and more 
active. The only reason I say we had a podcast a couple of weeks ago was the new Celebrate Recovery and Lifeway. And I think they said they have 80 people. Nice. And that was in the first, I don't know, four or five weeks. And yeah, it's uh, nice to see Celebrate Recovery is back yeah. because I think there was an effort some years ago, gosh, 10 or more yeah. um, that didn't didn't stick around, but it's a good program. Um, I would say just in general, the people that I've seen come through my court over the years who've really embraced their recovery and succeeded with it have usually returned to their faith base, yeah. their faith roots. Um, we've been really lucky over the years to have um, people who stepped up um, the the oh Baptist Church in New Philadelphia with New Beginnings and some of the individuals there who've really helped with the recovery community early on. Um, Rich Van Arsdalen came in and then uh, Scott Bell Scott was here Bell, with yeah. faith-based um, employment-related kind of things and character lessons. Yeah. And, you Next know, step. when people from the community step up, I mean... It makes it's, a difference. People right. need someone to care. And I think yeah. when community members step up and say, might not understand this, but right. heck, I care about you. And what can right. I do? I mean, I can't order someone to go to church. Sure, sure. You know, but if, if somebody from a church comes in and steps alongside, uh, as Scott Bell used to say, I, um, I meet them where they are. Yeah. And then just go on the journey from there. And, um, that is, I just think it's really wonderful and I've, I'm always grateful to see that. Um, but it's, you know, it's not a component of the program for yeah, obvious yeah. reasons. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Lisa, I know we're going to run out of time here, but one of the things, if listeners go, oh my goodness, how do I get my loved one into recovery court? Is there any <laughs> loop balls? Because I do know people view it as a very successful way for people to get to recovery or the requirements other than. Not, not saying committing a felony. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, I like to tell, I've had people come into my court, um, drug court or no drug court, who've said, you know, I haven't had a chance. I haven't had a chance to get help. And I remind people that help is always there. And, yeah. you've, you know, we've got this, uh, these agencies uh, on the poster right in front of me, um, you know, these agencies locally are not going to turn people away. And so I always tell them, you don't have to commit a felony to get help. Just walk through the door, ask, pick up the phone, ask for it. But and pretty much any door works in Tuscarawas County, Adams Board, Ohio Guidestone, Community Mental Health. There's not an incorrect door because we but, all work well together. Um, but more to your question, we do. It's not for violent offenders. It's not for people who have mandatory um, prison time. Um, but uh, they do an evaluation with our probation staff um, that evaluates uh, risks and needs, and then an evaluation with the um, treatment provider to also evaluate their risks and needs and their treatment level. And then they have to make the commitment that they want to show up every week. And, and they're actually um, in treatment or doing something in the beginning three to four days a week. Okay. And then uh, it tapers off over time. But it's, it's very intensive. intensive. It's very time consuming. It takes uh, a while to get organized. And some of our People are working midnight hours and having to fit in work and the program, but uh, the rewards are great. Nice. And how about yourself on your court? I, we do basically the same type of evaluation process. Um, you know, and, and honestly, and I mentioned this before, a lot of times I think attorneys will recommend their clients when they can't maybe get them the negotiated plea deal that okay. they want. So it's like, well, if you do recovery court, you know, then uh, you're going to have an opportunity to stay out of jail. And again, if if that's the starting point, 
You'll take it. I'll take it as, you know, as long as they're not committing new offenses. Um, let's give them a chance. Run into situations where someone's bringing some negative stuff into your recovery court that you do not want there. Well, you know, um, the hearings every Wednesday are mm-hmm. group hearings, and these people hold each other accountable. So you have people at all different stages of recovery all coming together um, and showing up for court. And in the beginning, they come every week, and then they phase up to the next phase where they come every other week, and then sometimes they only come once a month. But I still will always, I'll have the people that are just getting started who are doing all the lying, making all the excuse? I mean, ugh. Sometimes, <laughs> and sometimes I just sit up there like, "Do they really think I'm believing this right now?" But I don't have to say it because it's written all over the pa- faces of the other participants. Kathy Bazaar, the mentor, may be there saying, "You know," so it's not just coming from me right, because right, they're right. always testing me to see what they can get away sure. with in terms of will the judge buy this? But it's. It's so much better in recovery court because... Peer-to-peer, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and sometimes I'll just look at the other people in the group and I'll just go, <laughs> you know, remember when you all were at this point where instead of just taking account- responsibility or yeah. being accountable for, I messed up and I'm just going to admit it and do better? And, they, you know, yes. So it it's a beautiful thing to see mm-hmm. that... It's not just me, yet, 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 you know, because again, it goes in one ear and out the other. But when your peers who've been there and done that tell you, yeah, stop, right. you know, you're, 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 you're not telling the truth yeah. just it. And it's not helping you. You're, you're being self-destructive by trying to lie to the judge. I say that all the time. I'm going home at four thirty and start supper. You're not hurting me. Yeah by these behaviors or, or, or trying to fool me. You might fool me. Yeah. But then I go home and the next time when you mess up, you go to jail. So why just, just yeah, let's cut, not play this cut all game that here. out. Yeah. So, well, listen, for sake, sake of time, we're probably, we probably need to wrap up, but I want to say a couple of things. First of all, I appreciate the punishment and protection that y'all provide, but I think you do so much more And that is, you know, getting people into wholeness and playing that part. You know, there's a big part of the puzzle here that you all have and that you play in the community. So I appreciate that. Your desire to learn, to grow, to bring us the resources. Both of you, I hear your compassion. I I know both in the courtroom probably can, can be quite stern, but I think you can also, I'm sure, in the recovery court, people see your heart too, that you just want the best, um, for the participants or court ordered. I don't know what words you all use. Um, So I want to say thank you for that Um, and just helping us understand this a little bit more. And I think every time we hear a speaker talking about addiction from a whole bunch of different areas, you know, whether it's a police officer or a teacher or a judge, it really does help us understand that. And I think that's what we need is community members to understand this issue. So thank you for what you do. And, um, I, I guess that's it for today. Okay. Well, thank Thanks. you for, yeah. for doing these podcasts. I think yeah. they're wonderful because, again, sound waves are hitting somebody's ears <laughs> that maybe, uh, maybe didn't know. You know, yeah. if people just learn one thing from this yeah. or your other podcasts, we've, we've, we've advanced the ball a half a yard. You Very know, good. so thank well, you. Well, thank you. Thanks thank you, listeners. Have a great day. See you next week. for listening to this episode of the Tuscarawas County Anti-Drug Coalition podcast. Please follow us on Facebook and visit our website at adctusk.org.